Well, very good afternoon, uh, uh, distinguished participants, distinguished speaker. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar organized by uh, our three institutions, uh, CSIS, uh, Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore, or RS RSIS, <clears throat> as well as a National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or <clears throat> we know uh, as uh, GRIPS in, in Tokyo. Uh, this is, I think, uh, a continuous uh, cooperation between the three institutions. We organized uh, several uh, webinars already uh, during the pandemics uh, since March. And uh, I think uh, this one also is going to be a very <clears throat> important discussion that we are going to have. Uh, as we all know, uh, or before, I forgot uh, to mention that uh, we acknowledge the presence of uh, Ambassador uh, Kenji Kanasugi, uh, the incoming ambassador of Japan to Indonesia. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, I, I believe, uh, from Tokyo. Ambassador Ishii's uh, term, uh, I think, uh, will be uh, ended uh, pretty soon. And uh, we are looking forward to, to meet Ambassador Kanasugi in, in Jakarta, hopefully physically, not through uh, Zoom, uh, by the time you, uh, you are in Jakarta. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, before the pandemic, as we know, we already uh, experienced uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, uncertain times uh, due to the great power rivalries. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of has been happening uh, between the U.S. and China, and then the pandemic hit us. Uh, uh, the question about the consequences of <clears throat> this great power rivalry continue, and probably is being exacerbated by by the by the pandemic. But uh, uh, with the election of uh, uh, the, the Joe Biden, uh, we are not sure yet because uh, Trump seems uh, still fighting. Uh, but uh, I believe by, by, by January 5th uh, next year, uh, the U.S. will have a new president. But uh, whether or not the election of President Biden will <clears throat> reduce the tension or, or, or increase the tension uh, remains to be seen. And that's why I think uh, today we are going to have this discussion. Uh, we are trying to investigate the impact, the, the likely impact of the new uh, presidency in the U.S. Uh, and, and the rivalry between U.S. and China in our part of the world, in, in East Asia in particular. And for that purpose, uh, we are going to have a very experienced uh, and knowledgeable, uh, distinguished uh, speaker. Uh, we will have uh, Pak Joseph Wanandi, uh, the vice chairman, uh, board of Trustee of CSIS Foundation, and then, the, of course, uh, Professor Akihiko Tanaka, uh, President of GRIPS in, in Tokyo, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Ong Kang Yong, uh, the Executive Deputy, Deputy Chairman of uh, RSIS, and uh, I haven't seen uh, Professor Dewi Fortuna Anwar of the Indonesian Institute of, Science, uh, of Sciences. Uh, she'll be joining, uh, hopefully, uh, pretty soon. Uh, we are going to have... Uh, 10 minutes max for each speaker, so uh, we can have enough time for discussion. Uh, because uh, I see uh, on the screen, uh, we have uh, some expert as well. Uh, our very own uh, Ambassador Riza Sukma is on the screen. Uh, he's back in Jakarta, uh, done with his uh, uh, confinement in London. <laughs> now he's in uh, different confinement in Jakarta. Uh, but I believe uh, Bang Rizal uh, will have a lot to say about this uh, topic. And uh, I see as well uh, Professor Mioba uh, from Kanagawa University in Japan and uh, Dr. Adrian Ng, Joel Ng, and, and, and Sean Ho and, and others. Ambassador Imura, uh, I believe uh, they are going to have uh, uh, something to say as well on the topic uh, after the speakers. Now, uh, before, uh, I'd like to invite Pak Joseph Wanandi first uh, to speak about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, screen is yours, Pak Yusuf. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. Well, let me start to say that I don't have, of course, you know, the magic lamp, you know, to show what is going to happen in the near future in relation to the United States after the elections, after so many upheavals has happened and still are happening in, in, in the United States. But let me try. The United States presidential election is not just about the United States. The whole world is waiting to see how U.S. foreign policy may change in the coming month. For us in East Asia, we anxiously wait for the impact of Biden winning the elections on the global dynamics 
and the U.S.-China relations in particular. Well, you know, two big powers cannot live with each other, and that is the Thucydides trap. In the present era, these powers are the United States and China. China-U.S. relations is currently the most important, as global order could only be established through orderly and productive relationships between the two. Neither country could be able to realize its true full potential if opposition by the other impedes progress. At present, the dynamics are unfortunately counterproductive. All the pillars supporting sound China-US relations, security, economic development, and culture are being wrecked by both sides. <clears throat> it is mounting security concerns on every other dimension of the US-China relationship. Economic and cultural gains cannot fully compensate for perceived security losses. A recent public opinion survey indicates that citizens in the US and China increasingly view each other as a threat. The American public's unfavorable ratings of the PRC in 2019 exceeded even the very high unfavorable ratings in 1989, the year of the Tiananmen Square violence. Moreover, there is now an unmistakable trend in both the US and China towards assuming that civil society and educational organizations working on one another's soils are instruments of subversion rather than mutual understanding and shared benefit. For the US, for almost two decades, has undermined its own greatest soft power, which includes orderly governance at home and generally responsible behavior abroad. A series of issues have undermined their credibility. Iraq war, domestic economic mismanagement, global financial crisis, and withdrawal <clears throat> from agreements that Washington has encouraged and signed. America first, as promoted by Trump, is a doctrine with no attraction to anyone but a fraction of the American public. The economic interdependence between the US and China has been hurt by Trump. On China's side, Chairman Deng's advice, do not show off, and that China should accept that in many cases, China is still behind. If you remain pragmatic, you know when to stop <clears throat> and when to push ahead. Looking at China's policies of late, which some have been assertive towards the neighboring countries, it seems that Deng's advice needs to be revived. At this stage, China has to improve her policies of opening the economy for trade, which she has promised the world. China has also promised to respect intellectual property rights. How China is going to organize her economic development is her own problem, including how she will plan and organize her objectives with her technology development and when to achieve it. There are limits what the world could ask from China. The US strategy in Asia has been to prevent one single big power or a coalition from controlling the Eurasian landmass and the Pacific. The United States speaks increasingly of the need to cooperate with like-minded countries. But it seems that this does not include China. China sees hegemony and containment as the ultimate aim of US policies. At present, the US is facing China and Russia that are conducting joint military exercises as a deterrence against the United States. The alignment of Beijing and Moscow is growing closer as Washington seeks to construct a counter alignment with its Indo-Pacific strategy, thereby moving the relationship from the realm of mutual strategic suspicion towards strategic friction and mutual deterrence. Thus, the signals of the declining cooperation between the United States and China are everywhere. 
the current trade frictions between China and the U.S. are inflicting pain on the global economy as well as on the citizens of both countries. Taiwan and Hong Kong are, of course, big issues in their relations. The unanimous passage of the Taiwan Travel Act 2018 was signed by President Trump before making any statement expressing the intention to implement the act consisting with the three communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act, which has been the documents that provide the framework for China-US relations for 40 years. I argue that East Asia is lucky that Biden, Biden has won the election. If Trump is re-elected, it could be a calamity for the US and the world. The US could never recover from her former leadership of the world. In that case, a new rational president, quote unquote, such as Biden, would be rational and more sensible to China. But either way, the US policy towards China remains strict. The US will continue to think that China is not always honest in implementing her obligations and promises. With Biden as the new president, the US and China could have some mutual basic understanding and lay down some basic agreements on how two big powers should go about running the international order and peace, stability, and development in the world could be maintained. The world cannot accept a hegemon anymore in the future. International relations should be multilateral. China and the US could be the primus inter pares. Now, the US and China must decide whether they will pursue primacy and dominance or seek regional balance by making room for another, one another. The latter approach seems feasible and advisable, and the former does not. Both sides have to answer the questions each other put to the other. Will the United States make room for China internationally? And will China allow for the United States influence in the region, especially in the Asia Pacific? What can we expect now that Biden has won the election? First, maybe we have to be reminded that Trump has not been willing to accept defeat and transfer authority to Biden. This means, you know, another two months, possibly, until the 20th of January. This means that he can still create obstacles for Biden, especially if he himself or a member of his plan, family plans to run in the 2024 election. Some members of the GOP or the Republican Party will continue their support to Trump. Biden will come across difficulties in changing some of Trump's earlier policies, most of which, in fact, did not make sense. But he still has 20, 73 million plus votes supporting him, which is a healthy number of support from the public. Second, Biden will be most probably face a Senate that will be dominated by the Republicans should they win the special elections for the two seats in Georgia state, which will then give it's to 52 Republicans and 48 Democrats in the Senate. President Obama has six years of resistance from the Senate. Since it was won by the Republicans in 2010 and damaged a lot of his programs. Third, President Biden will face also pressures from the left wing of his party and made it more difficult for him to change Trump's earlier policies. Fourth, Trump's policies have damaged the image of the United States, particularly due to his arrogant and contemptuous ways of delivering his messages, including the United States alliances and friends. I think such damage will not be easily reversed. Many countries now feel that they can no longer depend on the United States and its policies. Fifth, although Biden's demeanor and style will be more amenable, but when it comes to US-China relations, a strong opinion has been formed within the United States. 
negative public opinion in the US towards China can be expected to try to have a more regular and normal relationship, sorry, will make it difficult to improve bilateral relations. No longer the motto America first, Biden can be expected to try a more regular and normal relationship with East Asia. Nonetheless, he is going to have difficulties to restoring normal relationship with China. I believe that Biden would make serious efforts to maintain a positive relation with China to a certain extent. In fact, both US and China would want to see a better relationship between the two great powers. But so many things have happened in the meantime. When Obama was president, the Chinese made the effort to obtain this, but it never got traction. Now we will be more important because of the balance of power is even closer than five years ago. So what can we expect now in East Asia? And how can the region contribute to a positive great power relations? For East Asia, regionalism is still relevant and continues to be the practice. We witnessed the recent signing of RCEP. This could be East Asia's way to deal with the US and China. ASEAN and its regional frameworks could contribute in creating the atmosphere for future meetings and possibly agreements for a new relation. The ASEAN plus three, China, Japan, and ROK and the East Asia summit are important avenues in the future. Yet ASEAN and the ASEAN plus three have to work very hard to get their ideas accepted by US and China through the East Asian summit. Thank you for your tight attention. Thank you, uh, Pak Yusuf Wanandi. And uh, uh, there are mixed pictures that you present to the, to the, to the, to the forum uh, that uh, uh, for the future uh, regarding the, the US-China competition and uh, how it will impact our, uh, our region in East Asia. But uh, I think we note that uh, <clears throat> uh, your point about multilateralism is, uh, uh, is the norm that is uh, more preferable. Uh, with China-U.S. relation at the core, and then the, also some pessimism, I think, uh, is uh, uh, <clears throat> is uh, is in the in the order that is. While Biden might be more sensible compared to compared to Trump uh, earlier, but uh, domestic challenges and political reality in the U.S. might prevent him from pursuing a more normal relations with East Asia. And then uh, there are uh, points that you make about the uh, possible contribution by uh, East Asia region, uh, the signing of RCEP, and then uh, ASEAN, of course, uh, uh, will be uh, two things uh, or two factors that uh, East Asia can uh, contribute uh, to mitigate the impact of the uh, consequences of the US-China uh, competition in East Asia. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Akihiko Tanaka to present your views about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, the screen is yours, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, the National Graduate Institute for Policy uh, Studies, I would like to thank uh, uh, Yusuf and Ong Ken Yon and CSIS staff and RSIS uh, staff uh, for uh, making this uh, webinar uh, possible. Um, to address uh, the uh, challenging topic of today, I uh, would like to uh, first uh, um, examine uh, uh, what uh, uh, seems to be uh, constant uh, in international relations and what can change. Um, the former, uh, what will be constant, we may be able to call uh, uh, it uh, the structure of international relations. Uh, the, the latter, what can change, include many things. Uh, who occupies the presidency of the United States uh, can change. And in fact, uh, as was mentioned, we are uh, expecting a new president uh, will be sworn in on January uh, 20th. So uh, what are the things uh, that are not expected to change uh, in the foreseeable uh, future? First, I think that China continues to grow its economic, technological, and military power does not change. 
China will not suddenly become weak. Second, the um, uh, second thing that doesn't change, the authoritarian nature of China's political system under the Chinese Communist Party uh, is not likely to change. The first tendency, China's continuing growth alone can bring about a danger of succeeded this trap, as Yusuf mentioned. But combined uh, with the second constant, authoritarian and repressive nature of China's political system will produce fear, at least among people in the liberal democracies, of losing their liberty as well as their security. If China dominates the world economically, technologically, and militarily, they fear China might impose its authoritarian rule upon all peoples in the world. Even if China might refrain from overt military action, virtually all countries, businesses, and media can be pressured to refrain from saying or doing anything that the Chinese Communist Party does not tolerate. What is unfolding in China-Australia relations now is a clear indication of this possibility. And because of this reasoning, I think, what will not change very easily is the determination of American people not to allow this to happen. On this issue, we see clear bipartisan consensus, especially in Congress. The birth of the Biden administration is not likely to change this determination of Americans. Increasingly, this fear is spreading to other liberal democracies, including Japan and Western Europe, and certainly Australia. So these constants continue to strain the US-China relations in the foreseeable future. The most important area of competition, in my understanding, well, if not uh, confront uh, outright confrontation between the two superpowers, I think will be uh, the area of technological competition. China's technological legitimacy could make the fear of the threat to liberty reality to Americans as well as people in other liberal democracies. So I think the United States will try all sorts of efforts to prevent China from gaining technological hegemony. For that purpose, the United States, I think, is likely to create and expand uh, what I might call the circle of like-minded countries to restrict undesirable transfers of critical technology to China. Also, in order to pressure China on this front, I think uh, the Biden administration may not uh, abrogate all the tariffs that the Trump administration imposed uh, soon, at least. Uh, and it, 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 it's a bit um, uh, strange to say because Mr. Biden criticized uh, uh, Trump's uh, trade war. But in my understanding, Mr. Biden is likely to demand China to fulfill the first stage agreement that the Trump administration concluded with China last January. Um, as it was not an agreement between China and Trump, um, but an agreement between the two sovereign uh, states. I think uh, this agreement uh, could be useful for the Biden administration uh, to uh, have better negotiations with uh, China. But of course, with the coming of the Biden presidency, many things can and will change. He already announced that the United States will come back to the Paris Agreement of Climate Change and that the United States uh, will not withdraw from the World Health Organization, uh, contrary to uh, President Trump's declarations uh, last spring. Mr. Biden also stressed the importance of the alliance. The NATO allies welcome this. In the telephone conversation with Prime Minister Suga, uh, Mr. Biden, reiterated uh, the commitment of the United States to the defense of Japan, including the Senkaku Islands. So 
we would be able to expect a significant uh, reduction of tension among the US allies. Um, such uh, institutions like G7 could once again become a forum to work out a unified policy stance of their approach to many issues around the world. Mr. Biden and his foreign policy team also uh, would participate in uh, ASEAN-centered international frameworks more actively than the Trump administration. American diplomacy will become more predictable. As his announcement of the return to the Paris Accord and his appointment of John Kerry as a US envoy on climate change indicate, climate change can be a major focus of his foreign policy. This is a welcome change to the international community because unless the United States and China make serious efforts to reduce their greenhouse gas emission, the efforts of all other countries uh, will become useless. Um, Xi Jinping already declared that China tries to achieve net zero emission by 2060. So if the US becomes ready to make bold efforts to cutting back on greenhouse gas emission, um, COP26, um, which is po postponed because of the COVID-19 uh, to the next uh, autumn, can become a significant international gathering uh, to accelerate joint international efforts. Well, in my opinion, uh, if only not to give excuse to China from retracting from uh, the carbon neutral commitment, it is quite important that the United States becomes serious about climate change. Next year, we hope that the world could enter a transitional period from the pandemic to the post pandemic world. During this period, one of the most important issues could be the distribution of effective and safe vaccines. It seems only natural that the countries where effective and safe vaccines are first developed tend to distribute them to their citizens. But eventually, vaccines should be available to people all over the world. A new international framework uh, called uh, COVAX facility, a joint mechanism to buy and distribute vaccines uh, throughout the world, established by the initiatives um, of um, Gavi and CEPI and WHO uh, is expected to play an important uh, role in this transitional period. Many countries, including Japan and China, have already committed their cooperation. The United States, unfortunately, has not joined this yet. With the coming of the Biden administration, I think Japan and other countries should persuade the US to join the COVAX facility. So if these areas of cooperation on global issues spread, the atmosphere of international cooperation improves. But we do not know if China refrains from assertive actions in South China Sea and the East China Sea. We do not know if China refrains from imposing more repressive measures in Hong Kong. Well, recent, arrest, uh, recent arrests of liberal activists um, suggest a contrary direction. Further, we do not know if China refrains from such bullying as it does to Australia. If China's behavior becomes less assertive and less self-centered, the atmosphere improves and the process of international relations would become more cooperative, even though the structure remains competitive. If not, the atmosphere remains only an atmosphere. With this, I would end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Tanaka. And uh, I think uh, the, the framework that you provide about the, the, the continuity and change or, or the constant and change uh, uh, are well taken uh, because uh, you know there are areas uh, for possible cooperation between US and China, especially in the climate, hopefully, and uh, with the new uh, commitment uh, by uh, Joe Biden uh, to, to, <clears throat> to come back to the Paris Agreement uh, might give us some, some hopes because as you noted that uh, without US participation and China's participation, the other efforts by uh, other countries to reduce the carbon emission uh, will, uh, will not be uh, very effective. 
uh, and the area of technology uh, for sure uh, is uh, one uh, contentious area uh, that will be very important for, for other countries as well. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Ong Kang Yong uh, uh, to give your views on, 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 the, on the topic for 10 minutes. Ambassador, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you to CSIS for hosting this. Yeah. I follow behind uh, my guru, uh, Yusuf Wanandi and uh, Tanaka-san. They have uh, covered uh, much of the things that we are interested in. Maybe I will just quickly sum up. Uh, I share their uh, various points, but um, uh, since I'm the third speaker, I think I can just sum up and say that it is going to be a challenging time, even though it is a different president in the United States of America. Yeah, maybe Mr. Biden is less egoistic than uh, Mr. Trump. But looking at the situation in the US, we are confronted with three basic issues. Yeah. The American president will be focused on domestic division in his country. Yeah, we have read so many things about uh, left and right. What about the center? Even now, center people of different persuasion have different opinion about what is the center in American politics. So first D will be domestic division. The second D will be what I call the American debt. The debt situation in America is very bad. Various studies are now focused on how can the US economy, how can the US society sustain that high level of debt. The United States government owes a lot of money to many different institutions and other things. But up to now, most ASEAN countries feel that as long as the US dollar is still the world standard or reserve currency, yeah, they can continue to uh, print the US dollars and uh, go further into that. But it is an issue and we, Ms. Uh, Janet Yellen, uh, hoping to become the first lady secretary of treasury in the US, this issue of the debt will be very much uh, in focus. That means that Donald uh, that means that Biden's uh, attention will be further distracted. And the third D that I have is actually what I call digitalization. Uh, perhaps this is a one new area that uh, my two seniors have not covered in their respective presentation. But over here in RSIS Singapore, we feel very strongly that the American society outside New York outside the stock market, outside the key research uh, location like the Silicon Valley, they are not digitized. They are very much uh, still in the early 20th century economic model. And the connectivity uh, is poor with the rest of the world in terms of what has happened with multilateral trade, with economic systems and so on. Yeah. Uh, actually, I look forward to more of Rizal Sukma's uh, writing and uh, articulation in the coming months since he has returned now to Jakarta. He is the expert on these kind of issues. But what I want to highlight today is that digitalization is critical. This particular US presidential election has shown how much more people can influence electoral outcome and opinion of the general population with regard to uh, political ideas and so on through the use of the social media. But the reason why social media makes such a headway in America is because the large segment of the American population is not digitalized and they are not IT savvy. So here we in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, can say to have an advantage because our young population in ASEAN 
Yeah, more than 60% of our ASEAN population uh, is under the age of 35. And almost all of these 35 uh, year old ASEAN citizens are actually IT savvy. So we are having some good uh, advantage as the world economy becomes more and more digitalized. But the point I want to make is that if the Biden administration is focused on domestic divisions, focused on the debt that the American economy is carrying today, and if they want to deal with digitalization to increase their competitiveness and their connectivity, there is little time left for the Biden administration to look beyond the borders of the United States of America. Whatever time they have, they look at Europe, they look at Russia, they look at China, they look at Japan, and maybe a bit of India. Yeah. So what do we do in ASEAN? I have mentioned to my colleagues here in the research uh, programs in RSIS that ASEAN must continue to demonstrate the value of its value-added uh, character. All these years, uh, as uh, Pat Yusof has uh, witnessed and uh, uh, worked with in various track two uh, pathways, uh, ASEAN can only value-add to what is out there so that people will give us attention, give us the policy parameter to operate. And also for all the ASEAN member states, uh, respective ASEAN member states, if we can do this value adding, we can play a role. Small country like Singapore, Brunei, yeah, Laos, Cambodia, we can have our voices heard and maybe we can do a bit more because we are always focused on value adding. So ASEAN value adding, uh, we were right on the existing mechanism, uh, but you saw I've talked about the East Asia Summit. Yeah, I think that is something we should now uh, do more, use more to engage uh, the Biden administration and even all the other big countries around the world. And uh, we have heard about the uh, arrival of RCEP. Yeah, and we also have the CPTPP. Yeah. So these are things which the Biden people will have to look at because they need to go back into the multilateral trading system. There is no other pathway for them to maintain US dominance or uh, supremacy in the global system except through economic and trade mechanism. Yeah, because that generate money, that generate a certain influence. Yeah, all of us are dependent on trade. If the American decided to use maximum pressure on whatever they don't like, then we are having to uh, bend a bit here, and bend a bit there to uh, continue the uh, relationship going forward. So I thought that this is a time for ASEAN to um, go back to our original mission. Our original mission focused around growing our own respective economy, our own society. Yeah. Don't allow Southeast Asia to be used by other people for their respective competition and rivalries. Yeah. How we do it, because we got no uh, what we call the kinetic power, we don't have military strength. And even in the early years and now, our soft power is still very briefly uh, minor compared to others. So we focus on getting people together, convene meetings, and value adding. So EAS, ADMM plus, yeah, even ARF, Papa Yusuf, can be refreshed and do more. Yeah. Biden and his people will be focused on Hong Kong, Taiwan, yeah, South China Sea, and now maybe Mekong. Yeah. All these means that they will look at ASEAN and our development and uh, needs in Southeast Asia as a secondary agenda. But never mind, secondary also means that they will still be present and be available to help us uh, as long as everyone maintain peace and security. It should be uh, something that we uh, can be grateful for. But more importantly, I think 
Biden and his team will have to look at Southeast Asia and ASEAN because there is so much US business interest in our region. And if you believe in all the studies that have been put out, yeah, American consultants have been very good at this. The one consistent thing that come across in all the studies, whether it is democratically funded or republicanly funded, or from New York or Los Angeles or uh, 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 in uh, Houston or in uh, 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 other parts of America, they show that the growth potential of Southeast Asia is tremendous, not only now, but for the next 20 to 30 years. Because one, our population is young and digitalized, more educated than many other regions, collectively speaking. Number two, we happen to be in a very good geographical position. People wanting to go into China, wanting to go into India, they come here first. If they make it here, uh, they can go further into all these big economies. And more importantly, Japan, Korea, the two economic dynamo in our region are focused on doing more in Southeast Asia. And lastly, China itself uh, is not giving this space in Southeast Asia to other people. So therefore, if ASEAN, we know how to uh, operate and get people to uh, use our natural assets or our clever management of issues and value adding capability, we will be able to stay in business and do more. Thank you, uh, Philip, I stop here. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Ambassador. Uh, there are a lot to be discussed uh, from your presentation. Uh, uh, for sure, uh, questions and opinions will come up later. And now I'd like to invite Professor Dewi Fortuna Anwar uh, for 10 minutes uh, <clears throat> to, to give your, your thoughts on, on the topic. Uh, the, the screen is yours, Ibu Dewi. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, thank you very much to CSIS uh, for inviting me in this very distinguished panel. And, and thank you. Uh, uh, I've enjoyed uh, the uh, earlier remarks by Pak Yusuf. Uh, Tanaka san, uh, uh, Pak Ong. So I'm lucky to be the last, but it also means that I don't really have much left to say. Uh, I will focus my, my remarks uh, really on, on the impacts of the uh, uh, Biden's elections to Southeast Asia. Uh, Ambassador Ong has already uh, uh, mentioned about ASEAN. Um, I think the, gen the general uh, mood in Southeast Asia, the general perception towards the defeat of Trump and the election of Biden has been relief. There's been a positive uh, attitude because the, the recent expectation that the US foreign policy will become normalized again, that it will become much more uh, reliable and much more predictable. We might not necessarily like all the policy, but at least you know they'll be based on uh, more uh, regular consultations and, and, and that the, uh, uh, it, it will be uh, uh, less uh, uh, arbitrary. Uh, and there's also secondly that uh, given that uh, Biden was the presidency of President Obama and that Obama really uh, reoriented US foreign policy to Asia with its Asia pivot or rebalancing to Asia, there's an expectation that you know, a similar focus on East, East Asia uh, will, will be resurrected, that there will be uh, not necessarily Obama 2.0, but that you know uh, the U.S. Uh, emphasis on uh, Southeast Asia uh, on, and, and Asia, you know, uh, will will also be a, a mark of this uh, foreign policy. And I'm and I'm looking at uh, what the expectations of uh, U.S. foreign policy would be. Uh, I I relook again at Biden's uh, foreign affairs article in 2016 when the Obama administration just left office, and and, and there was an article. Uh, of September, October 2016, titled Building on Success and Opportunities for the Next Administration. And here, Biden re-emphasized that, you know, the American foreign policy and American status in the world was at highest point during that time because the U.S. had succeeded in strengthening its relations with its traditional allies in Asia, uh, Australia, Japan, the Philippines, and South Korea, as well as expanding partnership. And here, uh, we, we always, there's a joke, always uh, uh, frustrations uh, that in Washington, uh, 
political leaders are not that knowledgeable about Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is sometimes only seen as a derivative of its China policy and, 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 and not many people know about ASEAN, but Biden uh, knows about ASEAN because in that uh, article, he respectively uh, pointed out that ASEAN, the uh, United States needs to work with ASEAN uh, to advance a rules-based order. So I think, I think that, you know, that, that, that is a, a very good start uh, for, for the region. And uh, also uh, his focus on managing region, uh, relations with regional power, the focus on, on US-China relations. Also, this is uh, very, very important that recognizing that US and China as the strongest uh, economies, the fates of these two countries are inextricably linked so that they cannot really be separated. And here it says that, you know, it's not, the question is not about competition or cooperation, but that competition and, co uh, and cooperation will have to coexist with each other. That the United States needs to, to be tough on issues that, that uh, you know, they need to stand up to. For example, you, uh, China's abusive policies and human rights variations, but on areas of convergence, uh, global uh, transnational challenges uh, like climate change, uh, like nuclear proliferation, and, and global pandemic, for example, you know, uh, the US and China need to work together within multilateral contracts. And, and this, uh, he has reiterated, of course, in his recent foreign affairs uh, article uh, of uh, March, April 2020 of why America uh, needs to lead again. Uh, very scathing criticisms of uh, Trump's um, foreign policy, which has alienated both allies and partners and, or, and, and led to a, a very diminish uh, American standing in the world. And, and in Southeast Asia, uh, this, this uh, perceptions of the diminishing of American standing was born very clear in a, a, a survey carried out by ISIS uh, late last year and it published early this year in a state of Southeast Asian uh, publication. Uh, it clearly shows that the US has really lost its, its uh, position. Within, within the region. When uh, South Asian countries are asked about which country is most influential, both politically and economically, China, by overwhelming majority, by over 70% of people in the region, right, regard that China is the most important political, uh, uh, you know, uh, the most influential politically and economically at over 70%, while the United States lags far behind at only about 7%. And when questions about reliability, as you know, as, as a strategic partner, as a security partner, uh, the U.S. has really gone down because during the Trump administration, uh, attention to ASEAN uh, has really diminished. Uh, uh, Trump only attended one East Asia summit uh, and, and, and did not in fact fill the uh, post of the uh, U.S. ambassador to ASEAN uh, in Jakarta throughout the, uh, that administration. So, so that that you know the uh, you. Uh, Biden is right that uh, United States needs to work hard, uh, and he uh, and he correctly pointed out that uh, in in his article that leadership uh, does not come you know by magic that it has to be earned and that United States need to be much more consistent and 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 work hard here. So uh, there is great expectations uh, in in uh, the region that the U.S. will again uh, pay attention uh, to multilateral cooperation and 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 will. Uh, support or uh, ASEAN uh, centrality. Uh, but looking at particularly on issues that are of concern to countries in Southeast Asia, the Foreign Policy Committee of Indonesia carried out a survey about the top priorities for the region. And the top priorities are first, you know, economic recovery, uh, which has dev been devastated by COVID, then the COVID-19 pandemic itself, and then unresolved territorial disputes, particularly the South China Sea and US-China rivalry. So while for most of us, US China rivalry comes at the top, for people in the region, it's economic issues that, that matters the most. Now on the US China rivalry, you, uh, countries in Southeast Asia are, have been very concerned at the escalation of uh, tension uh, between US and China under Trump, particularly with, you know, uh, it seems to be at all levels, the trade war, uh, the, uh, uh, the conflict over technology, even conflict over, over COVID-19. So multiple areas of, of conflict. So there is an expectation that under Biden, with this more, his more nuanced approach to China, where in the US, 
will need to be tough on China on certain issues, uh, but that it is willing to cooperate on China on, on, on other issues. That uh, the, the this uh, fear that Southeast Asia will be increasingly divided to be forced to take sides. Hopefully, it will be lessened. You know, because that is the fear of Southeast Asia that our region will again be used as a theater conflict that that. Uh, at the regional and also at the uh, national or even subnational levels, so that uh, we would be uh, vulnerable uh, to proxy wars as as this uh, uh, two superpowers uh, compete for for influence. So, if there are areas of cooperation, uh, that will also include other ASEAN countries and in areas where US needs to be tough, uh, particularly in the South China Sea, that is also of of, of great interest uh, to Southeast Asia. That will be welcomed uh, by, by Southeast Asia. On the economy, uh, Biden mentioned about, you know, that US will uh, oppose protectionism now, and uh, this uh, will be uh, of, of great, uh, you know, interest to, to the region as well, because the trade war between the US and China has really hurt, uh, hurt Southeast Asia. When in, in the survey you know, carried out by ISIS, all countries in the region said that, you know, you know, that the trade war between the US and China have really harmed the economy. And in fact, Indonesia, uh, 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 rank highest uh, of the concerns because uh, the, the the trade war has really harmed uh, uh, Indo Indonesia's uh, economy because Indonesia is much less competitive uh, in comparison to many other uh, ASEAN partners. So if uh, the US and Ch uh, China trade war uh, uh, is uh, eased, you know, it's no longer as intensified and, and uh, we need, uh, you know, that uh, protectionism uh, America first policy is reduced. There is an expectation that it will also uh, help us to uh, in our economic recovery. Also on on COVID nineteen uh, under Trump, this is an, also an area of of uh, uh, contestation. So under Biden, you know, he has emphasized the the, uh, the willingness of the United States to work with multilateral uh, institutions with other countries uh, on 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 COVID-19. So that that would be, uh, of, uh, of of course, very welcome for us. Now this, um, he emphasized about reintroducing democracy onto the global agenda, revitalizing democracy in America, and also bringing back democracy to the global agenda. And how will this be perceived in, in within the ASEAN region? I would argue that this, this is a, a very important uh, policy. We, we as, there's a general consensus that um, a democratic president tends to be much more value oriented in its foreign policy uh, uh, than a Republican, which is more uh, pragmatic. So under, under, a, de uh, under a democratic administration, uh, attention to values like democracy, human rights, and, and uh, good governance and, and environments uh, will, be, uh, will be intensified. And countries in South Asia tend to be a bit mixed about this. There are concerns about interference in the internal affairs of, of the member states of ASEAN, for example, you know, uh, uh, greater US scrutiny on democracy and human rights uh, practices uh, will make, make a lot of uh, leaders, regimes in South Asia uncomfortable. But at the same time, given the real decline in, in democracy and human rights uh, globally and within ASEAN, there's been a general uh, uh, decline, and um, there have not been much talk, talks about democracy and human rights after, after the signing of, and the the the, uh, uh, the adoption of the ASEAN Charter. It seems we seem to have uh, abandoned this, uh, and and, uh, and like in Indonesia, the focus on economic development and infrastructure uh, uh, building, uh, the interest on attracting FDI, particularly from China, has also led to to you know, concomitant decline in commitments to democracy and human rights. And also this growing concerns that the China model uh, of, of economic governance could be seen as a winning model. And, and to, uh, while this might not be of issues to some, uh, for to a lot of us in Southeast Asia, particularly amongst the civil society, this is a great concern. And, and, and this is reflected in the huge demonstrations in Thailand, also demonstrations in Indonesia, uh, uh, end of 2019, and, and also recently in 2000 about this democratic deficits and uh, the, the state capture by, 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 by vested interests, for example. So uh, there will be, you know, uh, a bit mixed uh, 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 reception to this uh, greater emphasis on democracy. Uh, but I think that it would be good also to focus ASEAN again uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, the question is whether China will see uh, uh, Biden's more nuanced approach 
uh, in managing relations with China, that you know, uh, coexistence between cooperation and, uh, uh, and and competition as a weakness, or whether it will be seen as you know as something that it will also embrace. If uh, it, it is it sees that as its weakness, it will weaken Biden, of course, and then embolden the critics uh, in, in America. Uh, say that you know uh, Trump got it right, but if Beijing sees this as an opportunity, then uh, we see that maybe hopefully the escalation of tension between the two great powers will diminish, and that will that will give more space uh, to to the region uh, to ASEAN uh, to be uh, to uh, carry out its uh, agency uh, and in conducting uh, the management of, of, of great powers uh, through ASEAN regional mechanism, including the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. Uh, the mentions about Southeast Good Asia. Was, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. Could the, you wrap wrap up? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, I wrap up that you know this concern that Southeast Asia is not of primary importance to the U.S. On the one hand, this is good because less heat to Southeast Asia, but we do not really appreciate on the whole to be seen simply as an appendix to China policy, given the attributes of Southeast Asia, its strategic locations, its size, uh, size of population, and and economic potential. Uh, I think it, uh, it is important that United, uh, the Southeast Asia should be seen by all other countries, including the United States, uh, on uh, its own merit. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ibu Dewi. And uh, I think we have uh, four uh, great uh, uh, presentations. <clears throat> and uh, if I may, there are common themes uh, of the four speakers. Uh, number one, uh, there are common concerns about the domestic <clears throat> situation within the US. Uh, especially in the U.S., uh, the strong uh, partisanships uh, within the U.S. population might uh, prevent uh, Biden uh, to pursue a more normal uh, international relations, as well as pa partisanship in the Congress and Senate, uh, domestic debts, as uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Kang Yong mentioned, a lack of digitalization uh, on the part of the U.S. society that disconnect, quote unquote, them from uh, what has been going on uh, in the other part of the world, trade, international trades, and so on. Second area or a com a second common theme is uh, uh, there are uh, area of convergence between the two, between the US and China. Uh, climate change uh, might be one, uh, vaccines cooperation and uh, global health cooperation and pandemics, uh, you know, how we mitigate the, the impact of the pandemic. Uh, these are uh, seen as a, a common uh, a convergence, a area of convergence between the two. And number three, I think the common theme is uh, the expectation of ASEAN to play a role. Uh, to turn competition of the two uh, into cooperations uh, by refreshing the existing ASEAN mechanisms, uh, various ASEAN mechanism, IRF, East Asia Summit, RCEP, and so on and so forth. And then, the, uh, in a way, uh, ASEAN needs to go back, according to Ambassador Kang Yong, to its value added as a convening power that could engage uh, US and China uh, in East Asia. Now, uh, I'd like uh, to uh, give, we have 30 minutes uh, for Q&A and uh, there's already one question from the floor before I ask uh, uh, maybe some of the uh, distinguished uh, participant uh, on the screen uh, to give some thought. But there's one question from the audience first. Uh, maybe uh, this is for uh, uh, either of the four speakers. Uh, what would be the future of the Quad under Joe Biden administration? Uh, will it be escalated uh, uh, into something uh, than just security partnership? Uh, I suspect uh, uh, Tanaka-san would uh, have some opinion on this. Uh, please, uh, Tanaka-san. Well, thank you. I think um, uh, the evolution of Quad um, has been um, one of uh, the interesting trends uh, in uh, this region, particularly Indo-Pacific implications. Um, I uh, believe um, the, uh, under the Biden administration, um, the evolution continues. Um, the the uh, incentive on the part of uh, Japan, Australia, India uh, to have better relations with the Biden administration uh, is very, very strong. And uh, the... Um, um, and then also, um, I think among some of the phraseology that um, uh, the Biden camp has been using include uh, such things like the uh, League of uh, Liberal Democracies. Uh, 
And so when it comes to American rethinking about uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific, I think US could consider um, uh, Japan, Australia, India, uh, natural uh, partners. And so I think uh, the Quad uh, uh, will uh, evolve uh, to uh, become uh, uh, stronger. Well, incidentally, um, GRIPS, uh, the, uh, under the initiative of Ambassador Imura and uh, uh, Mr. Shinoda, uh, uh, made a recommendation to the Japanese government, uh, uh, which includes uh, a recommendation to upgrade uh, the uh, uh, quad. Uh, we, we don't use the word quad. Uh, we uh, say uh, um, Japan, US, Australia, India, uh, a uh, regular uh, uh, foreign minister meeting uh, upgraded into the summit uh, level uh, meeting. And so I think uh, uh, whether you would call it quad or not, uh, uh, relations amongst the four countries, I think will uh, improve. Thank you, <clears throat> Tanaka-san. Uh, if I may uh, request uh, Ambassador Rizal Sukma to give us some insight because we know you are a long time observer of China uh, and uh, Indonesia China relation and China in general. Maybe uh, two or three minutes, uh, Bang Rizal, uh, screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Philips. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be back. It's great to see you, Pao. Pa uh, on the screen, you are the only one with the title of the, His Excellency. <laughs> and, uh, oh. and also, it's good to see Murasan. Uh, and Professor Tanaka. Uh, well, after four and a half years in London, I become less optimistic than before when it comes to the uh, United States. I don't think that it's easy to trust a country that can elect Trump as a president. <laughs> and I think the worst is yet to come. Probably in 2024, they still can elect someone's worse than Trump. So, you know, the key word that Ibu Dewi mentioned, the consistency, I think it's really, really difficult you know, to predict from now on. So the US has become unreliable. You know, if, if we use uh, Donald Trump's word, you know, they are risking you know, to become a shithole. So that's, you know, I think, uh, the things that we really need to you know, think, uh, think about, you know, to, to what extent that we want to put you know, our uh, 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 trust you know, in, in a country that need to restore its credibility as a superpower, needs to you know, uh, restore its credentials as democracy, and also need to regain trust you know, from partners and uh, allies. So it's, it's not easy, I think, you know, because you know, like Pa Yusuf mentioned, more than 71 million people actually still you know, elect you know, Trump, or choose Trump as, as his president. So the future of the US uh, I think you know, still uh, uh, in, on this very shaky foundation. Not to mention that I think Japan and Singapore and all of us need to educate the US now that Asia is not China, India, and the rest. So if you read the news of the Financial Times, you know, they're planning to have these three departments within the National Security Council, which deal with first China, second India, and then third, the rest. The rest means Japan, South Korea, and all Asian allies of, of America. Then you know I think we still need you know to educate uh, the U.S. Uh, about uh, about Asia. Second point on on China, I completely agree with Pa Yusuf uh, that you know we all need also to educate China you know to uh, revisit Deng Xiaoping's uh, principles you know in 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 diplomacy and in foreign policy uh, because you know we don't need this war warriors you know diplomacy that they've been you know doing over the last three four years. They you know will. Uh, create more unnecessary enemies uh, also. So I think uh, when it comes to China, so Indonesia, I think it's much better position you know, to tell them. So we need you know, some kind of division of labor here. Singapore and, and Japan can tell the US and how to you know, actually uh, change and then conduct its you know, Asia policy. And Indonesia can tell the Chinese you know, how to behave uh, in, in the region. So thank you, uh, Philip. So, so that's my uh, short you know, comments. Thank you, uh, Bang Rizal. Uh, while we are at it about uh, this uh, democracy, uh, the credential of the U.S. as the democracy, uh, questions from the floor through the through the Q and A uh, box uh, on on Zoom. 
uh, there are three or four asking about this democracy promotion, and uh, as if you know it should be pit uh, between democracy and non non democracy. That is U.S. against China, and then also uh, as uh, Professor Tanaka mentioned in his remark that uh, one thing that would not change is that uh, the authoritarian nature of the uh, Chinese political system, and that will embolden always the U.S. policymakers and probably U.S. society to uh, deal with China head on. Now, if I may a question, if I may have a question to all panelists, will it be possible to have a cooperation between these two superpowers that has completely different world value and a, a very different political system. Uh, because from, from the questions, it seems that you know, we have to choose uh, between the two. Uh, and, and for probably many countries, uh, especially developing countries, it's not really a matter of uh, democracy or non-democracy, but whether or not we can develop. You know? uh, so to all our panelists, uh, could you address this question about you know, uh, can we have a, a cooperation between, uh, uh, is it possible to have US and China cooperate regardless of their, you know, uh, different worldview about democracy and so on? Uh, if I may, Pak Yusuf first. Two minutes, Pak. Well, of course, you, you know that every time and again, you know, two powers as, as big as both they, they are. So it always means a problem. And, 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 and it does always not, has to be a confrontation. In many cases, it has been a confrontation, but in other cases, six or seven in history has been a peaceful transfer, like in the last one between Great Britain and the United States. So it is not impossible that we have to create that because otherwise there is no other way. The world is, 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 is its end, you know. With the pandemic, you can see you don't want to cooperate, you are going down the drain of everybody. So, so as simple as that, the, 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 the challenge that has been put by, by COVID, according to me, has shown that, that, that we in the future can no more, you know, stay behind alone, not the United States, neither China. So therefore, that is our chance as we can get our act together in the con in a community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pak Yusuf. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Ong Kang Yong uh, to give uh, kind of uh, your view about the questions. Well, I think there is no other choice, uh, Philip. If you look at the two big powers, if they don't cooperate uh, and basically stand on different end of the spectrum, then they are just going to be the two big powers by themselves. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is that the rest of the world today yeah, have 190 other countries, some small one, some medium power, a middle power, and some as big as uh, uh, the US and China. In fact, Russia is as big as US and China combined in terms of uh, territory. So if they insist on this old ideological uh, uh, divide, then I don't think uh, there is any hope for themselves. So in the end, it is mutual dependency and finding a way to, yeah, sure, you can maintain your democracy and your communist thing, communism, but in between, there is a lot of space for both sides to do more together. Uh, and Today, we have two very important world or global issues, which actually have no other previous uh, structure or order or what have you, except our respective bias and egos. Number one, climate change. And number two, yeah, the digitalization that I mentioned about. If we go on like that with digitalization and artificial intelligence, very soon, all of us don't have to speak here in this kind of lectern. Yeah, we will just go and press a button and some robot will speak like Yusuf Wanandi or, you know, uh, Rizal Sukma. Yeah. Then what happened to human? So if people are serious about democracy and communism, yeah, they go back to one fundamental point, which is human and humanities. Yeah. And I think there are sensible people on both sides to be able to uh, 
council for some middle uh, point where everybody can converge. The one thing that I want to add is that the four years of Donald Trump show one thing. This label called authoritarianism ought to be changed. Americans were subjected to four years of Trump authoritarianism. Yeah. So maybe we should be a bit more, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, uh, differentiated, more sensitive, instead of just throwing all these slogans and label around. Every country has a certain kind of authority. In Japan, yeah, in Thailand, in uh, uh, the UK, they respect uh, the monarchy and there is a kind of absolute quality about having a monarchy. Uh, is that something undemocratic? Yeah. So I feel that there is enough room for both powers, uh, US and China, to work together on how do we look at managing the climate change? How do we handle the uh, complete uh, taking over of our life and the way we know the world as it is by the machines and the automation and the Digitalization. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Ong Kang Yong. Uh, Ibu Dewi, uh, two minutes, please. Yeah, okay. Foreign relations, you know, conducting foreign policy, there's always this uh, divide about interest on the one hand and values on the other. You know, when, when do interests prevail or when do values prevail? But values are, of course, important in conducting foreign policy, but most time, uh, countries' foreign policy are based on interests and, and their interests. There are between the United States and China, there are of course divergent interests, but there are increasingly there are also a lot of converging interests. And I think Biden has mentioned that. And in terms of the promotion of democracy and the US taking the lead again on democracy, I think uh, it is recognized as, as about Rizal and about Yusuf mentioned about the US itself needs to get its house in order. I think this is recognized very much uh, by, by Biden and the coming administration that you know you cannot simply tell the world to follow you. Uh, if the U.S. itself uh, is democracy, is not in a very good health. So uh, I think it recognizes that uh, you know uh, people will only listen to the U.S. talking about democracy uh, when it gets its own house in order in terms of uh, protection, better protection for minorities and better integrity of its democratic system. Which, uh, by the way, you know Trump's denial of Biden's win uh, has actually uh, undermined the democratic process in the United States. Uh, will countries in the region? join in this alliance. Uh, some countries will, but countries in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, in ASEAN, we tend to be much more inclusive in our outlook, including in democracies rather than us and them. Uh, we like to engage with all countries aspiring to, to be democracy, like in the Bali Democracy Forum. So, uh, you know, there's, there's no easy answer for it, but I would argue that while there'll be those who are much more ideological, at the end of the day, uh, it's interest actually, you know, it's the most important in, in conduct foreign policy. Thank you, uh, Ibu Dewi. Uh, Professor Tanaka, uh, two minutes, please. Well, thank you very much. I think, um, you know, in ultimate terms, uh, it's very difficult uh, for the two countries with completely different value system to get along. Um, but uh, that does not necessarily mean, as the previous uh, speakers uh, indicated, that diplomacy is impossible. Um, the, for example, with China or with uh, the former Soviet Union that had uh, huge uh, stockpiles of nuclear weapons, uh, you, you cannot simply destroy them. Uh, th that will uh, mean your destruction. And so uh, uh, you have to coexist uh, with uh, the countries uh, under a value system totally different from uh, you. Um, the, uh, uh, and then in my understanding, uh, the Biden administration, although emphasizing democratic values, I think he used the word uh, power of example, uh, rather than uh, imposition uh, of uh, uh, American system on others. Well, in a way, um, liberal democracy uh, under the current world is in defensive. And uh, the US, uh, under the Trump administration uh, endured all sorts of authoritarian pressure from the president uh, to resist, to keep uh, American liberal democratic uh, system. 
well, maybe because I had not been in the United Kingdom, uh, uh, I uh, feel uh, somewhat more optimistic about the United States than we are. Uh, I trust the country that can still defeat Mr. Trump. Um, you know, under an uh, authoritarian figure like um, uh, Mr. Trump, uh, with all sorts of tendency of uh, all terrible authoritarian leaders around the world, the US uh, maintained its law and uh, finally uh, defeated him uh, in a completely democratic election. And I think, uh, uh, but then this still uh, means that democracy is on the defensive and uh, US has to restore its division and uh, US has, yes, has to be uh, careful uh, in um, uh, expressing their opinions about other countries' uh, opinions. I think uh, the uh, um, one good uh, uh, tendency among uh, the, uh, um, the um, incoming uh, leadership in uh, the Biden administration, they tend to be uh, more uh the humble uh, uh than uh, for 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 uh, american democrats um and so i think uh the um, U us uh, will create uh, a coalition of liberal democracies and uh, make lots of um, comments about the necessity of liberal uh democracies around the world but i think uh, they uh, um uh, they try to uh, uh, maintain a uh, balance uh, between uh, their values and uh, necessity of uh, coexistence. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, the, the, the comments from the four speakers answer questions about democracies. Uh, there are three questions at least about this democracy. I'm sorry that I paraphrase the question so that we can uh, you know, address uh, more uh, generally. Now, there's a question uh, from the floor, if I may. Uh, maybe this is for uh, speakers from ASEAN uh, about the what specific items would ASEAN want uh, to have on the agenda if there, uh, if there uh, would be an ASEAN-US special summit that was canceled uh, back in March. So if there is one, what would uh, ASEAN want to be on the agenda you know, uh, for Biden to, to accept? Uh, Ambassador Ong Kang Yong, maybe you can start uh, again. Uh, two minutes, please. Yeah, thank you. I would just say that uh, we should try to see how we can open CPTPP to participation by China. Because at the end of the day, if you look at what has happened in the past 40 years in our region, inclusive of China, Japan, Korea, India, Australia, New Zealand, it is basically trade. Yeah? And the contemporary interpretation of trade has to include many other things. Yeah? Uh, things like intellectual property, uh, environmental protection, sustainability of our various uh, extractive industries and so on. So all these elements have already been covered through the genius of the negotiator in our TPP, which is now through the great effort of the Japanese leaders uh, called CPTPP. So if we can find a way to engage uh, China into this uh, framework, it will be good. We need not have to say that we open our door uh, and have everything completely settled. But at least uh, go back to the early principle, uh, but you saw uh, when we did our ASEAN China uh, uh, um, opening of a uh, free trade, uh, we have this early harvest idea. So maybe there's one way to get uh, 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 the Chinese participation in a CPTPP. Uh, Secondly, I think we should talk about the Mekong region because uh, China is already actively engaged in the Mekong region. Yeah, water resource management and environmental issues, all these are critical. And if we really want to contribute to a, uh, 
uh, in a significant way to China, uh, to the climate change, Mekong region is important. It's just as important as the Amazon in the South American continent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pai Yusuf. Uh, uh, I'm more inclined to be like Rizal, to be pessimistic. I've been 40 years visiting the United States, four times a year, 40 years. And I still, at the end, come to the conclusion that there's not much that we can do with the United States and that they have a real interest in us. I don't think so. And that's why I think that our regional, you know, a, a co cooperation is a very important one to face all this type of uh, intrusions or imposition of, of the big powers. According to me, that is the only way East Asia uh, can survive and can thrive. And, and we have something to say now. I think we have done very well compared to other parts of the world, you know, on overcoming this, this, this uh, uh, COVID, for, for instance. We have been done very well in 08, you know, facing the big, actually, uh, financial problems that the world has faced. And we have done very well, despite we have to change government in Indonesia in 98, you know, when the financial crisis of Asia has happened. So I thought East Asia could be one of the most important part of the world in the future, because if so, as long as we can get our act together, I, I think it's something to be said uh, that we can do a little more. more. And, and, then, and then in relation to the United States, what they should do is listen to others more and not only listen to themselves. Thank you, uh, Pak Yusuf. Ibu Dewi, uh, two minutes, uh, your yeah. response. Yeah, I'm, I'm in between the pessimism and, and optimism. I'll take, I, I'll take the middle path. I, I agree that uh, there is perceptions about the United States being an unreliable partner. It's not going to go any way soon. Uh, it's true that on the one hand, the great democracy mechanism enables you know, Trump to be defeated. But on the other hand, what, what has cost American credibility is that uh, hard negotiated agreements uh, could be just abandoned. Uh, and then restoring them uh, uh, under a new administration is not a guarantee that another administration like Trump will not again walk away from that kind of uh, agreement. So, so this problems of credibility is an, an, an issue. And here I agree with Yusuf that uh, Southeast Asia, we have ASEAN now and East Asia, we are now in a position not to act as a supplicant to the United States, but in a, in a much stronger position to say, you know, this is what we are, what we have achieved, and that uh, the United States uh, need to be much more uh, attentive and, 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 and uh, to pay more attention to us. So, so educating the United States is also very important. But I'm not going to uh, write off the United States. It is still a great country. It has great potentials, innovation and the economy and, and uh, all those best research universities and, and it's still the greatest military, military, military power uh, in the world. It's just about managing it. So. Uh, I, I agree that the uh, ASEAN and other uh, should be able, you know, uh, to talk uh, with the United States in a way that will help to uh, uh, inform the United States about about the region, about the complexity of the region, uh, and and giving greater, you know, allowing greater uh, agency to region and and not simply to uh, to be sporadic in its attention, you know. Uh, and parachute when there's trouble and then go off again uh, and, and neglect it completely because it takes time to build trust, but it, uh, it, it's very short. It's very easy uh, to destroy. But finally, I would say that, you know, adding on the economic issues, uh, the US is really lagging behind China because it's not really taking uh, part in this uh, infrastructure development. So, you know, uh, it, it, it wants to uh, be able to compete with BRI, uh, but, uh, in the past, it did not, did not have that, that mechanism. But with this Build Act, you know, this better utilization of investment leading to development, uh, Build Act uh, under, under, uh, passed under uh, Trump uh, in 2018, uh, there is an expectation that the US, uh, with its uh, strong uh, uh, private sectors, will also be able to, to play a role in, invest in infrastructure development. So ASEAN uh, probably need to uh, remind uh, the, the next administration that you know the U.S. economy engagement in Southeast Asia uh, should also pay greater attention uh, to this, uh, you know, the follow up the Bill Act and and to the infrastructure need of the region. Thank you, uh, Ibu Dewi. Now uh, there's uh, we still have five five more minutes before we end the the, the session. 
there's this one question, and I think this is important on the economic issue that the Ibu Dewi just touch uh, upon. Uh, there's a question from the floor that uh, says uh, China is the key economic partner of ASEAN and the recent OECD projection uh, that China is going to drive global growth, but at the same time, the US uh, will remain the dominant power. Uh, now, what role uh, do we want US and China to play in such a setting? That China is uh, the driving for the global growth, uh, but at the same time, US remain uh, uh, one of the strongest, uh, one of the strongest superpowers. Uh, Tanaka-san, one minute yeah. only, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. I, I think it is a fact that uh, China's uh, economy is going to uh, lead the world economy in at least in the coming year, uh, because according to any projections. Um, the economies of most advanced industrial uh, democracies uh, will be stagnant until the COVID-19 pandemic is over. And uh, so um, the best thing that we all uh, do uh, is to uh, maintain good economic relations with uh, China um, and persuading China not to utilize its own market for political bullies. And uh, uh, I think that's what we uh, uh, are going to expect. Uh, I think I would like to uh, make some comments about the, um, um, the uh, uh, US and China's relations with CPTPP. I think the uh, Biden administration uh, is not easily um, um, able to persuade the American public to rejoin TPP. And uh, well, uh, partly because the U US had uh, concluded bilateral uh, uh, partnership uh, agreement with Japan. Um, and uh, so uh, the US appears to have uh, some of the gains uh, that uh, the, the TPP uh, uh, gives the US already. And so uh, uh, coming back to the TPP may not be on the highest uh, 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 agenda for, for Mr. Uh, Biden. And then on that respect, I think um, recent Mr. Xi Jinping's uh, interest in joining the TPP to me uh, is uh, simply a political ploy. Uh, to distract uh, uh, public's view uh, 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 when the United States is not able to rejoin TPP. Um, well, as long as the China continues to maintain the current communist system, it's impossible for the, the rest of the CPP members to accept uh, it. Thank you, uh, Tanaka-san. Uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Ong Kang-yong. Thank you. Many decades ago, no one believed the Soviet Union would disappear. So I think the wisdom of history is we should not always uh, rely on one interpretation from our reading and analysis on what the world will be like or what can happen in the world. After all, we are all diplomats, whether you are in a research center or you are in the foreign service, we try our best. This is the way to uh, encourage uh, hope and uh, having a more optimistic outlook for the humanity. Um, you know, going forward, I just feel that the challenge will be for us in ASEAN uh, to work with the other people around us uh, today we have our Japanese colleagues yeah, and uh, others. China's economic situation is something that appears rosy and um, uh, very positive going forward. But yesterday in uh, a newspaper report, the former negotiator of China which brought China into WTO, Mr. Long Yong Tu, yeah, by himself, you remember this old man? He said that, you know, the Chinese state-owned enterprises and the Chinese domestic economy required a lot, a lot more uh, motivation to reform itself because for China to do what it wants to do on a global basis, the domestic economic condition and structure must be far better than what it is today. Yeah. And then on the other side, 
in recent months, we see American economy. We thought they are the powerful economy in the world. Everything should be great and the structure and institution and the processes are all in good shape. But when we look at it today, eh, something is not right. So I think uh, maybe there is a middle path. We all learn from one another and try to give mutual support to give our own, uh, to enhance our, uh, our mutual uh, uh, resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kang Yong, Ibu Dewi. And then uh, the last will be Pak Yusuf. Uh, Ibu Dewi, please, uh, yeah. one minute as okay. we already exceed the time. Okay, yeah, on, on, on the uh, economy, this is really not my, my, my uh, area, Philip. So I will concede the floor here to one who is much more knowledgeable about that. All right, thank you, uh, Ibu Dewi. Uh, Pak Yusuf. Well, I think, you know, the COVID actually has shown to the world that if we are not cooperating with everybody, we cannot solve this problem. We are thinking only on the vaccine. That's just you know, a small problem in the whole context of the aftermath of the COVID. The economic problems has not even been touched yet. We talk about a little bit about debt, uh, you know, uh, uh, problems to be solved led to the, 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 the most poorest countries. But that is not the, the question of restructuring and, and, and the world economy as it should if we are really taking care of the future, you know, of, of, of the world economy. So therefore, according to me, we cannot escape both this, of these big countries to participate. I, I think that is true that this American actually economy is not as strong as Kang Yong said. They want to help us with infrastructure. They, uh, their infrastructure is the worst in the world. What do they want to say? There is no roads that is good, you know, in, in, in the United States. There is no train that is running on time. So what do you want? It's nothing. So therefore, you know, we have, as Ken Young said, we have to get them all together. There's no way that we can otherwise change the whole you know, problems that we are going to face in the, in the future on, on, the, on the economy because of all these pandemics. Thank you, Pak Yusuf. Before we close, I'd like to invite uh, Imurasan, if you uh, have something to say. Uh, to, to, to close this uh, session because you, you are one of the initiators of this series of webinar that CSIS, RSIS and GRIPS uh, conduct. Imurasan, or oh, one or two minutes, please. Uh, you are still muted. Do you hear me? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you very much, Philip. So it has been wonderful and the very productive discussions we had. Uh, the one, one of the most important questions uh, is, has been a little bit missing, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the strengths and cohesiveness of ASEAN. Uh, you have been showing uh, some di uh, division among member countries, and uh, uh, particularly in terms of South China Sea, and uh, on other issues. And on this, you, uh, be you become cohesive. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, ASEAN will be, all Southeast Asia as a whole, will be a uh, uh, theater of uh, competition for sphere of influence between United States and China. And uh, now I do understand that you have been discussing uh, among member countries, always uh, on the occasion of uh, summit and on the occasion of uh, uh, economic and foreign ministers, we have been discussing about COVID-19. But uh, now uh, it's also time for you to discuss about how you can be cohesive and uh, uh, you can maintain solidarity among member countries regarding South East China Sea. Uh, I think this is uh, the question which I want to ask Rizan, uh, who is who looks so nice after having uh, suffered from a serious illness. Uh, congratulations. And um, if you have some time, uh, can, you, can you answer me the question, uh, my question regarding uh, ASEAN and South China Sea? Sure. Uh, uh, Bang Rizal, would you like to respond very quickly? 
Well, it's the, the, the answer is actually, you know, it's very long, so it's be hard to discuss. Probably we need, you know, another session, especially on the future of the South China Sea dispute, you know, and how to deal with it. So I think that is a good, you know, it's a good topic as well, you know, especially in the context of the new administration in the US. Sorry, Marissa. I can, I can talk more about Brexit now instead of South China Sea. Oh. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think uh, we've uh, <clears throat> exceeded the time and uh, I, I would not be able to summarize uh, the rich discussion that we have. But one thing uh, uh, for sure is that US-China relation is uh, not one dimensional, it's a multi-dimensional. So I think uh, we should find ways to engage uh, both US and China uh, for the benefit of East Asia. That's the only thing I can say about the discussion. Uh, a summary is uh, yours to make and the conclusion also uh, are yours to make. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists, uh, the four panelists for their uh, great insights and uh, of course the participation from the floor as well. I apologize if I'm not, uh, I was not able to invite more views from, from, uh, from other uh, uh, distinguished participants, but uh, this is not going to be our last webinar. So uh, we hope that uh, we are going to see you again, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, very soon. Thank you uh, and uh, have a good day. Stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.